Is your entire IT staff outsourced 20 some things? Is your cloud environment architected by a thought leader's fever dream? Have you swallowed heaping gallons of the DevOps Kool-Aid only to find out that you're one miscom fig away from losing everything? Oh, Sean Marshall here, to, and I invite you to flex seal your CI CD pipeline. If you're interested in diving deeper into this topic, my entire slide deck is on tinysi slash flex seal. Um, their entire slide deck is also on download slide channel in Slack. So feel free to go either way. And now we transition to the about me slide. So three things I do, I code, I teach, I hack. So I am a developer and cybersecurity consultant for secure uh, organization called Secure Ideas. We do penetration testing, red teaming, and we focus heavily on web applications and cloud infrastructure assessments. We also do network tests and things like that as well. And we also do continue mo continuous monitoring and scanning using AWS. Um, there's, there is a full professional um, bio of me in the link in the slide deck below. But I don't know about you, I just wanna jump into the topic. So here's the ground that we're gonna cover. First, I'll define what a CI CD pipeline is, and then we'll focus on three strategies for funneling security throughout the whole process. Um, if you do not have any idea what I'm talking about for Flex Seal, just Google that real quick. Just watch it after the talk, you're in for a good treat. Um, so the three strategies we'll be focusing on are based on FlexSeal family of product. FlexGlue, we'll flex glue different components together using CloudFormation. FlexTape, um, our packages and dependencies while we're building in the pipeline. And we'll also flex seal the build containers that we'll be using and have a demo demonstrating all of this. So. A CI CD pipeline is a system that allows multiple versions of the source code to be integrated, built, and ready for deployment. In a perfect world, we get from repo to production in seconds. In the real world, we either end up with something that's either painfully slow or something that forces out way too much information at once. The focus of this talk is to bake in as much security as we can without sacrificing efficiency or availability. This is the kind of stuff that we need to integrate in existing systems. So that tagline, it works under, it even works underwater should apply to all of these strategies that we're gonna talk about. There's a lot of tooling available in this space. So like Travis, Jenkins, GitLab, and a myriad of other players. In this talk, we'll be centering around Code Pipeline. Why? Because it's the tool I'm most familiar with, and therefore it is perfect. But um, no, it's a decent tool because it's relatively easy to set up and it allows you to automate build and deployment processes. This can be as simple as a two-step deployment for an S3 bucket, or it can be as convolute, it can be as convoluted as you would like. And when you use code pipeline, you will get temporary access to a build container with the AWS CLI installed, bash, and outgoing internet access. The other tools that we will discuss will fit neatly in this. But first, we'll think we'll need an example. Now imagine for a second, you're building an online portal and it's going to be serverless. So you'll deploy the client side application to an S3 bucket. All the requests will be handled by Lambda functions grouped under a REST API defined at API gateway and user information and user group will be stored in DynamoDB. Now, each one of those lambdas will need to access different APIs and other AWS resources at different levels of authorization, depending on the user, the authorization level of the user making the request. Does that sound convoluted to you? Trust me, 
you have no idea. But these are the types of applications people are building nowadays. So it's perfectly normal to have a cloud native application that speaks to dozens of services. Now the question is, is how do we tie all this stuff together? How do we do so securely? We could, we could have engineers creating things like through the console manually, but that process is error prone. And there are way too many opportunities for mistakes here and there. And so we need to tie things together cohesively. And the first fundamentals of that is understanding I am in AWS. So here's the crash course. I am or identity access management has to do with users or entities acting on users behalf. There are hours of content to go into each one of the topics that we discuss here, but we'll stick to a general overview for now. Users and groups are self explanatory, right? Um, we'll be focusing most of our definitions on We'll be focusing most of our definitions on I am roles and I am policies. So let's start with an example. I'm a user in my AWS environment and I have two roles. As a developer, I have access to source code, whether it's stored in GitHub or, it, or AWS code commit, the Amazon based solution. As a consultant and as part of that consulting role, I also have permission to spin up an EC2 an EC2 instance to crack passwords. So that makes sense. The roles are, diff are just groups and sets of one or more policies. Each one of these is JSON documents specifying what a user can and what a user cannot do. So if you now, not only are users, it's not just users and groups that are AW that are, it can be defined with AWS roles and policies. AWS services have their own roles and their own policies. So for example, in the serverless web app that we discussed before, the built code pipeline is, has its own role. And part of that role, it needs permission to access GitHub and S3 and the permissions needed to build the source code or de and deploy it in the cloud if there's a cloud formation stack, uh, if there's a cloud formation template embedded. More on that later. And of course, S3 has its own special set of policies called bucket policies, but that's out of scope for this talk. Messing up on your IAM roles and policies can make your AWS environment insecure. And you can also mess up your IAM roles and give services access that they don't need. So in the Capital One breach, for example, when the attacker uses CSERF to get on the EC2 instance, she was able to query the permissions that the EC2 instance have by accessing the, that accessing the metadata. So she's like, oh, the server has full S3 access. Well, why don't I just dump the data for all 300 buckets and see what pops up there? So if Capital One had exercised the principle of least privilege, making sure that the policies in line and the policies and role attached to the services only have access to the things that they need, then the breach wouldn't have nearly as much damage. So secure use of, so secure use of AWS involves mastering IAM roles and IAM policies. Here's a reality, here's a real, bit of reality. Um, most of your code is written by someone else. Everything is a loose collection of parts stuck together. We're talking APIs, microservices, libraries, open source and legacy cloud. And cloud native applications are no different. Not only do they have all of those things, they also have AWS services cobbled together as well. And so this is where you need to flex glue things together. This is where cloud formation templates come in. So you can think of cloud formation template as a blueprint for provisioning cloud services and infrastructure. Think of it like a UML diagram 
except this document actually helps you create working software. So you can push a button and deploy an entire stack for an application based on a single JSON file. You can provision most AWS services, including IAM roles and policies using CloudFormation templates. So if you template your entire tech stack, you can replicate, modify, and version control it. And by doing that, you can get something a bit more elegant. So if we're going to be gluing things together anyway, let's flex glue it together. Now, here's a bit of homework for everyone that has Node in their stack. You can use the package manager or to audit your dependencies for vulnerabilities. You can do this with NPM audit or yarn audit if you're hipster trash like me. And there's uh, several tools that could do the job like Sneak and GitHub's Dependabot, but this is free. You don't have to install anything extra and there's no configs that you have to mess with. Often you'll find that these simple tests produce nothing. You, all, your all your dependencies are up to date and they don't have any active vulnerabilities. But sometimes you get a laundry list of vulnerabilities ranging from low to critical. So a lot, this tooling is available in C Sharp, Java, Go, and many other languages. And a lot of tooling is, of, is open source. Now, if you want to fix some of these problems, we can just tack that on the end. Now, never, not all patches will be easy. Some will have breaking changes, but a lot of patches are just three words on the command line. This can be done in an afternoon on a staging app, or it can be done by one person over the course of a week if there are breaking changes. Rather than spending the time and money to get your red team to point Nessus, point the SAS and DAS tools that may not even work, or Burp Suite and other tools at the web apps, you can eliminate and detect a lot of the low hanging fruit in the pipeline itself. So you can fix leaks in your dependency by patching your depend by patching them with flex, with this sort of flex tapey sort of way. Now we go on to containers. With Code Pipeline, AWS gives you a provision container with deployment controls. Now, many of you are already using containers in your environment and tech stack, whether it's just Docker containers that you manage yourself or multiple Docker containers in a Kubernetes cluster that aid in building and deployment of your services and products. The world of container security and container hardening is vast and growing, but here are some tips that I can offer for you. First, is do not run service, any more services that are needed. Okay, not every single container in your orchestration cluster needs access to orchestration tools, needs access to, uh, needs access to um, a whole suite of Unix tools. If I am an attack, if, if I'm an attacker on an engagement and I pop a, con and I pop a container, one way to make my life really difficult is to eliminate things like curl and eliminate things like curl and make it difficult for me to reach out to the internet and download my tooling into the container to try to reverse shell and pivot throughout. So you don't need, it's not a VM. You don't need to pack everything in the kitchen sink into your containers when you're building and running them. Second, you need to understand that Docker access is root access. The Docker daemon runs as root. There is an experimental version of Docker currently being play tested right now that involves rootless access. Um, those, the link to that is available also in the slide deck um, where you can find those resources to try to play around with that in your environment. But as it currently stands, Docker in production right now, if you give a user access to Docker by putting them in the Docker group, you're giving them root access 
I can, there's also another link in the slide deck to show a simple privilege escalation in about 10 seconds. It's not that difficult. So you need to understand that not, you need to understand that systems need access to Docker and not necessarily users. Then you need to understand to also avoid Docker bind mounts like the plague. Now, bind mounts are, Bind mounts are insecure because they open up the file system of the host to the container. And it's fine for development, local, and playtesting purposes. But when you're shipping out containers in a production style environment, you need to use volume mounts instead. And then finally, you need to understand that uh, there's an excellent meme going around about Docker and the coronavirus but that isolation between apps is not absolute. It's not a VM. It's a compromise between running a virtual machine, which could take minutes, and in terms of DevOps and cloud infrastructure, that's centuries, and then just running it on the hardware itself. It's compromised between the two. So the doc so any container shares a kernel with its host. So if you keep the host system's kernel patch, you can avoid um, the you can avoid attackers who pop the containers to avoid those kernel level vulnerabilities into in order to escape the container. And so if you follow these tips, you're well on your way to you're well on your way in improving the security of the containers in your environment. Now we jump into the demo. So here we've got a brief demo of the portal that we've discussed in the uh, beginning of the talk. As we go through, we notice that, oh, the build failed. Um, what's, let's see what's going on. Let's investigate in the logs. And when we dive into them, we find that all of our other services work. We've deployed the CloudFormation stack, the unit test work, the API is deployed correctly, but we notice that there is a moderate level vulnerability. And we'll see that at the end of this log right here. Now, I don't know about you, but my boss will not allow me to ship code with cross-site scripting in. Now, if you're working in a system that has um, a high availability requirement, maybe you would instead trigger uh, something in CloudWatch to alert the incidents response or patch management or the developers themselves to try to quickly figure out a patch to address the moderate level of vulnerabilities that wouldn't necessarily trigger an ultimate shutdown and not shipping, um, and not shipping the, the product into production. What you do in your environment depends on your tolerance for risks and your processes for vulnerability management. And so you may ask, all right, so give me the tool that automates all this work. I'm sorry, I don't have it. I've shown you tools, tactics, and strategies to help builders and security teams be more, be more effective. There is no handyman in the can. None of these tools replaces the people that must use them. So whether you're a builder or an infosec, you're a plumber. You're either laying down pipes, checking for leaks, or fixing them. And by strengthening the connections between parts, analyzing the building materials and preventing data, analyzing your building materials and preventing data leaks, you can help keep the flow of information going throughout your organization. I thank you for your time and I thank you for your attention. Woo! And now I'm going to, now I'm going, I, I told you I'd run through it slot.